All right, I am going to begin. So I'd like to uh, first start by saying welcome and thank you for joining us for this Zoom town hall informational meeting in advance of the congregational meeting, Sunday, May 23rd. Um, and I'd also like to say personally, I just wanna thank this community, community for the support and care, and care of uh, Dave and myself. We really appreciate it. I'd like to open with a chalice lighting and these words. And I think I'm just gonna pretend cause I'll never be able to relate it, so. Amidst the swirl of life's joys, celebrations, challenges, and fears, may we remember to take time to think about this flame and see the possibilities within the vastness there. And to remember that this moment in time is but a flicker, not an inconsequential flicker, for the work we do matters. Let us anchor ourselves in what we know to be true. We have been called to this work and our work is that of this congregation. We are touching lives and when we touch lives, we change the world. May the flame of this chalice we have now kindled ground us throughout our meeting as we do the work we have been called to do, the work of this community, which we serve. The purpose of our meeting today is to do a general overview of the 2021 annual report, which you received in your email on Friday, with a focus on the issues that require a congregational vote. The agenda slide you're looking at right now is for the annual meeting on Sunday, May 23rd, not the meeting we're doing today. And this agenda is contained in the annual report. I'm happy to welcome representatives of the various committees and teams who have worked to prepare each item you'll be seeing on the ballot to the town hall today as presenters. If each of you would please introduce yourselves at the time uh, when you're speaking, we would appreciate it. I wanna first start by commending the quality and vitality of the reports submitted by the various working groups of our congregation our settled minister, other affiliated ministers, the various pro program committees and our staff. Secondly, I recommend each of you take the time, break it up if need be, to go through and read all 22 of them. They are so well written and I cannot help but be tremendously impressed by the talent and energy of this congregation as represented in these reports. Grab your laptop or tablet, a nice cup of coffee, and please read all about it between now and then. We'll leave space after each ballot issue for anyone to comment or ask questions. Jennifer May, whose technical expertise and role as moderator last year, created and facilitated the voting process for our first Zoom congregational meeting, has thankfully agreed to run through how the voting process works. Although we would not have predicted it, here we are again with a virtual meeting. I will not venture to guarantee anything, but our hope would be that we can conduct our annual meeting both in person and virtually next year. Jen, if you could please talk about the voting process. Sure. Hi, everybody. I, I have to, uh, Jennifer May. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm supposed to introduce myself. <laughs> Jennifer May, um, as Diana mentioned, um, I was moderator of the board of trustees last year as we entered into our virtual space. Um, and yes, I could not have imagined that we would still be in that uh, at that time, but we did devise a way to conduct the business of the church uh, via Zoom and it worked really well last year. So uh, we will repeat it without uh, really any modification. So those of you that did it last year um, are now experts and can help anyone new. <laughs> um, but in a nutshell, uh, normally in our in-person annual meeting, after each item is presented, we would do um, motions on the floor and then a vote um, per item. 
the difference in our virtual space is that the motions will be brought for each item and the vote will be tabled until the end of the meeting. And then um, there will be an online Google Forms ballot and the link will be provided uh, at the conclusion of all of the items being presented for you to click on. The Google Forms link uh, is fairly friendly, um, kind of hard to mess up, but we do ask that each voting member uh, vote individually. So if there's two of you in, in a, or more in a household that are eligible voters, uh, you'll need to do the form multiple times. You can, it will ask for your email as well and, we, and your first and last name. These are really critical for us to do validation of the voting. So, um, you know, uh, much like if you were voting in your local election, make sure you put your correct information in there because that's how we'll validate the votes on your name that's entered. So if you go in and then your spouse goes in, make sure you update that information and, and differentiate uh, person A and person B and person C, however many are in that house. You don't have to have separate email addresses, but we do want those different names because we will look up the results on the back end in a spreadsheet and we'll tabulate the results for each item. I'm sure Diana will go over the voting requirements for each item and it varies. So the critical part about doing the online voting is that, um, is that you're, you're voting individually. Um, you can do this on a phone, on a tablet, on a laptop, on a desktop computer. It should render the, uh, Google mm. is smart about it and it should look fine on any device. The voting is really just for your yes, no, abstain. It is not a replacement for the annual report. As Diana said, there's a lot of content in there that is not replicated on the voting. Um, so read, read first and then vote at the meeting. Um, and the voting will end shortly after the meeting ends. Um, so we ask people to vote real time. If you can't be at the annual meeting, there'll be an opportunity to absentee ballot via um, an online form as well. Any questions for me? Uh, I'm just gonna throw out that uh, last year, if people had the ballot open during the meeting, they actually had to close out of the ballot and open it up once the uh, ballot became active. Right, so we won't open the balloting until after everything is, but if but we will provide the link ahead of time so you can test it. So Dave, you're right. If I've, when we open the ballot, you may have to refresh that, that link. Um, you know, either hit refresh in your browser or re-click the link so that you can get to um, the current version of it. If anything changes during the meeting around the content or the wording of the motion, we'll make those updates before we open the ballot. That's one of the reasons why we don't open it beforehand. Plus we want everyone to focus on what we're talking about and not, not, not on the tech, right? The tech should just be the how we get it done. Good, good point, Dave. Thank you. Back to you, Diane. Well, maybe okay. I and uh, I could find it in <laughs> uh, so the other the next voting item, which is one of the 51% uh, for approval is the the minutes from last year's meeting. Uh, if anybody has read through the minutes from last year and has any comments about that, uh, Dave Smelter can uh, will respond at this time. Well, so, I need some help. Uh, there was a second to a motion and I couldn't understand the name. So I put, it sounded like Val Henry, but I don't think we have a member by that name, do we? We do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. then I'll take out the question marks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Are there any uh, comments or questions on the minutes at, at this time for our info session? Um, there is a question in the chat on the voting from oh, thank you. and I just want to address that. Um, and the site to vote will be a link that will be provided in the Zoom 
it'll be a separate window that comes up besides the Zoom meeting. It'll come up in a browser window. It's Google Forms, um, so it'll just be a URL that comes up in a, in a regular, whatever browser system you, is your default system. So Chrome or iOS, Safari, uh, uh, hopefully not Internet Explorer, but <laughs> I hope that answers your question, Ann. Okay, I am now going to return to my theme of read, read, read to learn about all the highlights of this past year that is contained in the reports. The accomplishments and activities of this vital congregation cannot possibly be condensed in the time that we have today. Nonetheless, the most visible is of course our Hobbs Hall, now forecast for completion in May, alleluia. The Hobbs Hall startup teams are gearing to take it from there in preparation for the time that we can safely gather in our new building to enjoy coffee hours, social events, and an expanded version of living our values through outreach to, to the community. Another major highlight has been our virtual worship services, services weekly vespers, and ways we've used Zoom and other technologies to be in community with one another. We have all witnessed the creativity blooming before our very eyes and ears as we experience joyous musical performances with rich harmonies by the same person in a loop or many voices or many voices. Multiple howls are a perennial favorite. Wonderful storytelling, videos, slideshows, and thoughtfully crafted sermons interwoven with carefully chosen readings, all combined for a meaningful spiritual hour week after week. And we are grateful. So now moving into the ballot items. Uh, the first that we're presenting today is going to be a change to the bylaws, which is another 51% uh, required to, to pass or be approved. And there you can, can see it on the screen. The Board of Trustees appreciated the congregation's approval earlier in the year for us to experiment as a seven person board in order to evaluate its effectiveness. In March, we held a thorough and robust discussion which resulted in a unanimous vote to recommend a bylaws change reflecting that the Board of Trustees shall comprise seven active members, revised from the previous nine. The board report contains more details on our experience, but in addition to better fitting our policy-based governance system, we found that the smaller number allowed for a more lively group dynamic where all voices were heard from on a regular basis. I'd like to invite any comments uh, or questions or concerns at this time from uh, congregation. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, shoot. You're on, Ann. Go ahead. Oh. Oh, okay. I just was going to ask, um, what about other UU churches? What's what's the common number? That's that's a good question, Ann. Um, of course, a lot of it depends on the overall size of the congregation and what type of uh, of governance system they have. But we did do research on this and in, in, uh, in checking with mainly material available on the UUA's website. And for congregations that have similar to our size, that have uh, the policy-based governance where a lot of the uh, operation, uh, operational with different, with committees, different committees, they do go to a smaller board that has more of the um, the the oversiders we often say the balcony view and is not uh into the 
uh, the myriad details of, of the operation and running of the church. Thank you. Okay, can we explain this, the get, because people seem to be confused by the get. Oh, the get, oh, is, the get is, comes out, is, is, is a subgroup, if you will, of the, of the board of trustees that each new board uh, elects for itself. And it is, is a group that, that be, because when you have a variety of people, whether it's seven or nine, everybody has uh, various obligations and schedules. And when something would come up that might need a quick decision, emergency action, uh, the, the, the um, board moderator, assistant moderator, the secretary and then a member at large is appointed to, to what we call the, the GET, the governance executive team, to, to meet and convene on a, sort of a emergency as needed basis. It's rarely enacted, but it exists for those times when, when it might be necessary. I hope that helped. And when it's enacted, it meets with the ministry executive team. It's not just the GET. It meets in consort to make decisions with the ministry executive team. I believe that's correct. I think it depends. But I think, yeah, I think it depends. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and even if we, when we move on, if somebody wants to circle back to a point or a question, please, please feel free to do that. Uh, but I think at this time we'll move forward and um, I will introduce uh, Lo Lois Weir, the church's treasurer, and uh, thank you very much for your work and guidance for the church on, on uh, preparing, proposing the, the operating budget for next year. So go ahead, Lois. Oops, one moment. We can't hear you, Lois. There we go. Nope. Nope. How about now? How about that, now? That's okay. Much better. Thank you, Diana, for that introduction. Uh, thank you. It's it, this is my third year as treasurer, and um, I've been really I really enjoy doing this for the congregation. Um, and thank you for placing your confidence in me. Um, first, I'd like to talk about the current fiscal year, 2021, which uh, runs from July 1st, 2020, to June 30th, 2021. Um, for those of you who were involved in it, you might remember that our fiscal 21 budget was prepared before the pandemic began. Um, before, and, and even when we revised it for the annual meeting, we had no idea how long we were not going to be able to meet in person. So um, it's, it's been an interesting year. However, um, fortunately, we have not seen, we did not see a larger than usual number of unpaid fiscal 2020 pledges. And fiscal 21 pledges are still coming in pretty close to what we budgeted. So thank you everybody for keeping us healthy during this difficult time. Um, many of our expenses have been a little bit lower during the pandemic um, by virtue of the fact that we're not meeting or worshiping in or person. worshiping in person. But we do have a few new costs associated with virtual worship, like our Zoom accounts and things like that. Um, but mainly the, the biggest impact uh, of not being able to meet and worship in person has mostly been on our non-pledged income, like our plate donations and our rentals and things like that. Um, 
And also I might mention that our Thanks for Giving auction team mounted a very successful virtual event in November. Um, it was great fun and more successful than, than I imagined it would be. It still didn't quite meet the budgeted revenue goals for the auction. However, um, we're looking forward to the upcoming Mind the Gap online auction next month. And we have really high hopes that it's gonna more than make up for the shortfall. So that's all good news. The other good news was that we got a CARES Act Paycheck Protection Program loan in, um, in, back in June of last year, uh, which has since been forgiven. That helped us get through 21, fiscal 21. And it's also gonna allow us uh, to carry over some funds from fiscal 21 into the coming fiscal year 2022 when we're really gonna need it. And I'll have some more on that later when we talk about the budget. I did wanna mention first though, that I'd like to give a shout out to Jim Scott, who uh, at the request of the board and the MET, he performed an informal review of the church's finances uh, this year. This is something that we do every few years. It provides, um, some external oversight into, into our finances, um, just another measure of, of security to make sure that our church's finances are, are being handled properly. Um, his full report is in your annual report packet. Uh, I encourage you to read it. Um, it was a big effort that he undertook to make this happen. And I'd also like to thank Mary Beth who really took extra time out to give him the information that he needed to perform this, um, this review. Um, the, the overview is his results found, found mainly that our church's finances are for the most part transparent. And as your treasurer, this makes me very happy because this is really my highest priority um, for this position that I'm holding with the trust of the church. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the fiscal 22 budget. Um, our church's bylaws require us to prepare a balanced budget that must be approved by the congregation each year at the spring annual meeting. And what this means is we have to make reasonable estimates of all the expenses that we're going to be incurring in the coming year. And it also means that we have to show where the funds come from to pay for those expenses. And this is the main reason why pledging is so important. Pledges are by far the largest source of income for this church. And it's important that we get a realistic estimate for this number so that we can create the rest of our budget accordingly. Um, so in terms of income, which is shown on this slide in front of you here, um, I'd like to say that thanks to the work of our generosity team who mount our annual budget drive and all of you, our pledges are up about 7% from last year. Thank you. And as I mentioned earlier, we estimate that we're gonna have um, some significant carryover funds from fiscal 21, and that number is shown on this table as well. Um, we continue to be thankful to the memory of Jean Weninger and Cheryl Casper, whose gift to support the settling of our new minister a few years back, um, part of that's gonna be applied again to the fiscal 22 budget per the board's designation. Um, we may need to draw some from our contingency fund this year. Um, and uh, probably you will um, recognize most of the other sources of income on here. They'll be familiar to you, except possibly for one. Um, if we don't realize some additional income from unpledged donations or other sources like facility rentals from Hobbs Hall, we may need to draw from an unrestricted bequest, which is currently being held in our endowment fund to get an, we may need to draw from that fund to get us through this first year. We uh, cut our budget in as many places as we could to avoid this. Um, short of cutting personnel hours. We felt that that wasn't really a, a good thing to do at a time when we need our staff and our minister more than ever in this time of growth and change. So we don't want to use these funds and we've uh, made the commitment that they will be the absolute last source that we draw from if we need them. 
Um, and I have to say that I have high hopes that in the coming new year, we're gonna see some growth and some new activity that, that will let us minimize the, the use of these funds. So let's talk about expenses. Let's go to the next slide. Um, for fiscal 22, um, our, our fiscal 22 budget allows us to continue to fairly compensate our minister and our staff according to guidelines provided by the UUA. Um, health insurance premiums, which we also get through the UUA, are going to be going up about 10% in fiscal 22. Um, in addition, we're living into our goal of being in right relationship with our staff by providing dental life and long-term disability insurance to our eligible staff members. Um, this is a relatively small expense that really goes a long way towards caring for the people who this congregation depends on to keep the church going strong. We're going to continue to pay our fair share contributions towards the UUA program fund. And um, in fiscal 22, we're going to start making use of our, our new house, Hobbs Hall. And we have a lot of new expenses associated with operating it. Um, these include utilities and maintenance, snow removal, additional insurance, and more hours for our sexton, who um, because of the increased hours is now, now eligible for benefits. So like healthcare and retirement. Um, on the budget tables in your annual report packet, you will find these facility expenses and personnel expenses. They've been distributed among our six program areas based on the percentage of their time that our minister and our staff use to support these areas. And so they're rolled into the numbers that you see on this chart here. Um, um, but you can, but overall, our total uh, annual budget, mainly due to the increased cost of maintaining Hobbs Hall, has gone up uh, about 40, 50,000 over what we had last year. I don't remember the exact number. We're growing, and that's good. And our budget reflects it. Um, you can see uh, your report packet for more details on the budget. And please feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have any concerns or questions after this meeting. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions from the, the members right now. Thank you, Rose. Come on, somebody has to say. I'm allowing for uh, various typing going. speeds. <laughs> ah, here we go. Does the budget include salary increases for the staff? Thank you, Rhonda, for that question. Yes, um, the UUA recommended a small 1.2% cost of living increase, which we applied across the board, and to bring our sexton and our DRE up to fair compensation uh, guidelines, fair compensation levels based on the guidelines from UUA, we, we gave them each uh, an additional small, small bump as well. Okay, again, um, don't feel bound by the way we move on. If somebody wants to return to a question, we'll have time at, at the very end as well. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, to Rhonda Richardson, I guess I am introducing a few. Uh, please go ahead and uh, thank you so much in advance for introducing the slate of leadership candidates. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay. Um, thanks. I'm Rhonda Richardson. I am the, this year I served as the chair of the Leadership Development Committee. I want to take a minute to um, acknowledge the other members of the committee. We worked, seemed extra hard this year um, to, to get the slate filled. So I want to thank Trish McLaughlin, Kathy, Kathy Slater, and David Brown, who, um, who worked with me on the committee this year. I also want to thank everyone who received a phone call from us and who took the time to think carefully about whether they sort of had it in their capacity to step up and serve this year. Um, and particularly grateful to those who accepted the invitation to serve. I'm, we just continue to be impressed and amazed and gratified by the, the breadth of um, leadership in our congregation. So um, the slate for this year will include um, three new members to the board of trustees. So now that we're moving to a seven member board, we'll have, you know, in one year we'll elect three new members and then next year we'll fill two and the following year will be two and then the following year we'll be back to three. So that's how this will roll out. So the um, nominees for the board of trustees, each of whom will serve a three-year term ending June 30th of 2024, sounds so far away. Um, Heidi Schaefer Bish, Rod Thompson and Carol Weigand have all agreed and accepted our invitation to, um, to be nominated to the board. We also um, will this year be electing one new financial secretary. So there are three financial secretaries and they each serve a three year term. So every year we, and those are on um, staggered terms. So every year we, we fill one new financial secretary slot. And then every year we um, elect a financial secretary alternate um, to serve one year. Um, so the new financial secretary for a three-year term would be Nancy Dockerty. She's the nominee for that. And then the nominee for FinSec alternate is Sandy Eagland for one year. She has just finished one year in that role and she has agreed to fill us another year as the FinSec alternate. So she's the one who kind of fills in if, if one of the three uh, financial secretaries is unavailable in a given week. And then moving on from there, um, the, our endowment committee also consists of three members and again on staggered terms, which means every year we need to um, elect a new member to the endowment committee. And this year, Bonnie Harper has agreed to accept the nomination to the endowment committee to serve for three years through June of 2024. And then finally, our leadership development committee um, also we have three members who serve on three-year staggered terms. And in addition, each year, the, the, board, the board appoints, appoints one, of one of the board, board, board members, members to join our team for a year. And that's, that's really helpful to us to have a voice and a, the perspective of someone who's really familiar with the, um, the kind of current workings of the board. So um, Kathy Slater has agreed to be nominated for a three-year term through June of 2024. She, she was on the team this year on an interim basis because uh, Danny Beal had to step off the team for personal reasons um, back in the fall. And so Kathy Slater came on an interim basis and we're really grateful that she has agreed to um, stand for election to a uh, three-year term on our leadership development committee. I think the next slides show the individuals who will be continuing in their elected positions um, for the coming year. So we won't be voting on the, these people were elected in years past to um, most of them to three-year terms, but we just wanted to acknowledge that these are the people who will be continuing. Um, so Liz Bright and Viv Sandlin, um, on the board and for one more year and Don, Greg and Diane Kloss each will serve two additional, two more years 
from the board. Um, financial secretaries continuing, Marion Yeagler and Eric Van Bars. And then the endowment committee continuing, Shirley Kiernan and Jennifer Gregg. And the leadership development team again continuing will be Trish McLaughlin and myself. So um, I'm happy to entertain any questions. And before I um, give up the floor, I also want to just take this opportunity to encourage anyone who's interested to consider this year attending General Assembly. Um, we have lay leader development funds available as sort of a scholarship if any of anyone needs financial assistance for that. It's completely virtual this year, June 23rd to the 27th for a $200 uh, registration fee. And again, we have funds available. There was an article in the e-news and that will continue running um, every week that provides the link to the application for those lay leader development funds. We, we really want to grow more leaders in our congregation as we grow in size. So, thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. And I see a, a question from uh, Kathy Kearns, and I think um, to try to not lose too many things in the cracks, I think I'd like to re return back to that at, at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, if Lois, if you could be uh, address Kathy's question in the yeah. chat box. The correct number right now is the 27921 that is shown on the slide that was put up earlier. Um, that number is going to continue to de decrease as we so pledge government directly from that. Um, uh, no, the money that we are taking out is is um, principal as as well as well as interest. Um, the church policy right now uh, indicates that we. Yeah, but... <laughs> Lois is frozen. Yeah, but I'm not. <laughs> She's <Yeah>. just upstairs. <laughs> Got to battle, battle it out. Yeah. <laughs> Come back, I'm... Lois. Uh, let's come back to it. I'll make her come, come back to it. That's an excellent suggestion. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So, so Rhonda, thank you again for introducing the, the candidates for next year. Uh, then we, we will move on to another. Um, I, I, I do want to add that the budget is also in the 51% category for, for passing and approval. So the, uh, the next thing we're going to look at that is a, uh, a voting item for the congregation is the appointment of Reverend Christy Anderson as the church's affiliated community minister. So Christy, if, uh, if you are on this, if, if we could just spotlight, spotlight her for a moment, for a moment to, do that. to do that. Thank you. That's all. Wasn't too painful. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so this this item is uh, truly a delight for me to to introduce to you. Reverend Stephen has recommended that by virtue of Christie's training, ordination, and service to the greater community, the congregation vote to confirm and approve the appointment of Reverend Christie Anderson as a qualified candidate to serve as the church's affiliated community minister. Reverend Stephen would like me to share with you some information on her background to better appreciate her contributions and broad range of experience. While I thought that I might have known Christy, I found out in learning about her work-life experience, I found it very inspiring. Uh, the following summary of, of Reverend Christie's resume pertaining to her life of service, particularly for those, for those in our community who are under-resourced. And I'd like to thank Reverend Stephen for his initiative on this important appointment and for preparing this capsulation, which I'm gonna share with you. 
While living in government subsidized housing for three years as an adult, Christie developed a passion for empowering people marginalized by the American economic system. After she earned an MA in urban planning, Christie was able to pursue this interest throughout her 30 year career in Portage County, in Portage County in the field of social services. As the longtime executive director of the Portage Metropolitan Housing Authority, Christie collaborated with social service agencies and worked hard to create networks and partnerships in order to enhance economic self-sufficiency for members of the under-resourced population. She also served on a number of action teams examining critical and unmet needs in Portage County. Through decades of relationships with local so social service agencies, Christy has gained an extensive knowledge of the delivery system for support services in Portage County. She also gained valuable experience in navigating governmental bureaucracies and has grown to better understand the issues that challenge the daily experiences of the economically marginalized. Upon earning a UU commissioned lay leader designation in 2008, Christy became a resource for the Minister of Congregants needing support from social service agencies. Following retirement from full-time employment, Christy enrolled in the new seminary of interfaith studies community ministry, ministry program to enhance her skills in service to the low income community. Christy was ordained as an interfaith community minister in 2012 at the Unitarian Church of All Souls in New York City. And as I recall, this required a lot of time on Megabus. Christy, Christy Christy continues her community ministry by being involved with the staff, staff and the entrance of social, social services, services on a limited, on a limited basis. basis, and by actively participating with local justice groups, including the NAACP, the League of Women Voters, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and the Education Committees, UUCK's Race for Justice Action Group, and the Kent Interfaith Alliance for Racial Reconciliation and Justice. Christy treasures the values of the UUCK Church, and she is grateful for the opportunity to demonstrate them within the wider community. So thank you, thank you so much, Christy. So we are going to now move into the um, what we call the congregational statements section. section. And uh, Christy, which I feel confident will not be a problem in any way, the bylaws require 85% uh, of the quorum to approve her appointment. For the congregational statements, uh, the bylaws act ask for 75%. So to start the um, introduction of these items is Christopher Dumb from the uh, Shared Ministries Committee, who will talk about the Covenant of Right Relations. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Again, my name is Christopher Dumb. I'm the chair of the co uh, <laughs> chair of the Committee on Right Relations, um, and we've been working on um, with Reverend Stephen building this Covenant of Right Relations for our congregation. Uh, we read a book by. Jill Rendell um, on how to do this. And so we've crafted this covenant, this working um, and adaptable covenant um, for you all. Um, I just wanna read through it here um, for you and then open up a discussion here. So our covenant of right relations, in order to live out our UU principles and respect the inherent worth and dignity of all people, we covenant to number one, welcome discomfort, and that we learn to welcome discomfort as a source of spiritual and personal growth and an opportunity to reflect, ask, connect, and expand. Number two, we covenant to manage conflict, and that is to identify and to adhere to established mechanisms and available procedures and resources by which we approach and handle conflict with others, as well as with leadership, Number three, we covenant to make space for disagreement, to hold space for dissenting opinions, and to design meetings and agendas 
to allow for conflict and disagreement, the idea that this can be healthy for us. Number four, we covenant to take responsibility and that we speak for ourselves and take responsibility for our own actions. Number five, we covenant to value diversity, to believe our community is strong enough for different perspectives. We will look with curiosity for truths and minority views. We promise to listen thoughtfully to ideas from others and to be conscious of and fully acknowledge others' emotions and interests, especially if we don't agree. And number six, we covenant to move forward together. So we forgive the mistakes that others make and that we make ourselves as we learn to address conflict and disagreement. And key here that we recognize this as a living, breathing document that will change and adapt as we grow together in covenant. And I want to thank, we had a, um, a virtual meeting in October um, that was open to members of the congregation. And I want to thank everyone who attended and helped um, guide us through um, thinking about this process and speaking about their experiences and what right relations meant to them. Um, as, as a congregation, we've gone through some times where uh, people perhaps were not in right relations with each other for various, for various reasons. reasons. And it is important for us to learn how to handle that together um, as a congregation that loves one another and welcomes one another. Um, so just for example, you can imagine even some sort of, you know, scenarios where someone in our congregation might say, you know, oh, I'm a Christian. And maybe someone says like, well, why do you believe that stuff for? Um, and so a covenant of right relations says that there needs to be a way for us to recognize this situation, to recognize this harm and what we should do about it, right? And we could sort of imagine without a covenant of right relations, um, this situation could escalate and one person could just say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm leaving this conversation and people might get angry and, and form clicks or take different sides or something. Um, and we see a lot of negative effects. So the purpose of this covenant of right relations is to draw us into a position to recognize and take responsibility for differences in actions and to find ways to uh, confront those differences um, and confront conflict because in any situation we're gonna we, we are going to have conflict and as this covenant mentions uh, minority views and dissenting opinions are very important for a congregation to have um, and so just want to be able to recognize those situations and handle them in ways that help our congregation grow as much as possible and prevent any sort of um, splintering um, within within our group together. Um, so this has uh, been available for uh, folks in the congregation. Um, people, if you have questions or comments on it, please feel free to uh, to voice those. You can also email uh, the Committee on Shared Ministry um, to discuss um, any issues about that. But uh, we, we thank you for, for your time today. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, Vivian Salmon, who has uh, dual hats as a board member and also chairman of the Social Justice Committee, will uh, speak to the the other two statements that are uh, you will see on the ballot for the annual meeting uh, in May. Hi, everybody. Well, five years. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about um, a statement from our for our congregation, and then the second statement will be to endorse a UUA statement. So five years ago, our congregation began a process of educating ourselves to understand our own racial biases and practices and to do the work of challenging racial oppression in the community and the society. Church member Marianne Stevens introduced the idea of holding workshops and then making a public pledge to work to end racism and we held what were called Living the Pledge workshops in the spring of 2017. And out of those workshops came our congregation's commitment to Living the Pledge. Mm -hmm. Folks created the Race for Justice team, which has been the most active social justice ministry in our church for the past few years. The Race for Justice team has done education of church members and friends. That's been a big focus. The team has worked in coalition with other faith groups through the Kent Interfaith Alliance, uh, KIFA, and has worked with community groups like the local NAACP. The team has led our members and friends in marches and um, vigils, and they've made our congregation visible in working to end racism in the community. Well, now we're in a moment of, I think, real possibility for change nationwide. And 
we as a congregation are called to take a formal stance to recommit ourselves publicly, publicly to, to do is somebody speaking? I hear a voice. Um, to uh, publicly to make a commitment to undo our own racial biases and work to achieve racial equity and justice in our community and in our society. The Race for Justice team has written a statement declaring this collective commitment. And the church, here it is, the Church Board of Trustees has endorsed this statement. And you can find this statement in the um, annual meeting packet on page 14, and here it is. And we will vote on whether to approve this statement at our annual meeting next month. It's short, so I'll just read it briefly. As people of conscience, we uphold our Unitarian Universalist values of justice, equity, and compassion that call us to recognize the worth and dignity of all. We seek to become an inclusive congregation where everyone finds a sense of belonging. We pledge to do the uncomfortable work of confronting white supremacy and racial bias in ourselves and our institution. In order to be a catalyst for change, we will follow the leadership of black, indigenous and people of color and will build partnerships with BIPOC organizations. We commit ourselves to bold action in ending systemic racism through uniting in witness, speaking courageously, advocating for institutional change and participating in community action. We believe that only by liberating our collective souls from racism can the beloved community become reality. And here we will see the, um, what will be on our abbreviated tagline, uh, three items, uniting in witness, speaking courageously and collaborating for freedom. So we will be voting on this um, at the annual meeting in a month. Any questions about this? I want really need, we absolutely to give the credit for this to the race, race for Justice team. And they wrote it. I didn't write it. They wrote it. And uh, it's, I, my own view is it's an amazing statement. No questions? Okay, you can read it in on page 14 of your, um, the, packet so then so then the, the, oh that's me that's my voice echoing i'm thinking people keep talking and it's one voice echoing back at me because of the problem we're having all right the final item um for a congregational vote uh is it's a statement it's um it's it's a statement for the uua um a statement what's called a statement of conscience the background here is that the UUA regularly adopts the three-year study action issues that are proposed by the different congregations. And after three years of study and reflection, they put together a statement of conscience, which they then vote on at the General Assembly. And this statement, this statement is coming up and um, it, it appears on our annual report on page 15. However, I have to make a correction. I discovered this morning that since we put together this annual meeting packet, the statement was changed. Not a lot, but it was changed. It's no longer called a statement of conscience on undoing intersectional white supremacy. Um, it is now called undoing systemic white supremacy, a call to prophetic action. Most of the language in this new draft is it's almost the same as what's in the draft in the packet, but not exactly the same. The term intersectional white supremacy has been changed to systemic white supremacy, and there's some additional explanation. Mary Beth will send out the revised statement of conscience. So I apologize for, well, it's not my fault, but I apologize for this being wrong, but you know, we didn't know they were gonna change it. And the board has endorsed this, and um, I'm not gonna read it because it's very long. I'll just say that it's, um, it's a call to address systemic white supremacy that's embedded in institutional, uh, in our institutions and in ourselves. And um, we will, if, you know, we are gonna be pledging as church members and as congregations to um, 
engage with the movement in our communities and nation to heal the evil of racism, to engage in healing actions beyond and within the denomination, and to build relationships across boundaries of privilege and oppression. And we must struggle for justice for all oppressed people. So any questions about that? I, I just want to add, um, Vivian, just for a little point of clarification that what the congregation will be voting on is for our church to endorse that this statement appear on the agenda for the General Assembly. Right. And then if there are enough churches who vote to endorse, the, then the statement will appear on the GA agenda for a vote by the group assembled at General Assembly. So that's it's, right. It's just the yeah. formal process that's been established to, to go through. So so we're just saying yes, we think this is important. And the the, the entire UUA should uh, consider this statement for adoption. Which I'm sure they will, but <laughs> right, but um uh, please read it before the um, annual meeting because it's it's the new one's going to be going out. You're going to get the updated one. Okay, so uh, at, at this time, the that concludes uh, coverage of uh, the main parts of the of the annual meeting in May and all of the voting items. Uh, so this would be the time for any final questions, concerns, or comments. And I, I do see some in the, in the chat box from Kathy with, a, with an answer from Lois, if um, you want to address this uh, out loud, this would be the, the time. So I think I, I answered the question in the text. Uh, the answer is we're, we're withdrawing from the principle of the endowment. The number is in the chat there. Um, my comment was that we're going to decrease that number equal to however many new pledges we get between now and July 1st. Um, and um, the main reason we've not been earning a lot of interest on our endowment fund up to now is that the church policy prevents us from investing those funds in the stock market. Um, one of the things that it's it's now on our radar because like for the first time in forever, we actually have an, a significant amount of money that that we have that we could invest. And so um, the, we're charging the finance committee and the endowment committee to get together and maybe look at other ways that they we can earn some more um, earnings on those funds that's uh, still consistent with church policy. So that's the short answer. Um, it is, it's definitely something that we're looking at. Does the UUA give any guidance on that? The UUA, that's a good question that I do not know the answer to. Uh, the UUA has its own investment fund and socially responsible diversified investments. I, I found it online and actually sent the link to some people. Um, I think Lois, I might have sent it to you this morning. You probably did, and I haven't looked at it. Yeah. Anyways, they have other churches are, are put their money in their fund. I think total they have two hundred fifty-four million dollars invested in uh, their fund. Over the last three years, it's averaged nine percent increase. Um, so, but that's, I'm not saying that's the best solution. That is, you know, that's what they have. And that's certainly something that these committees could look at. Um, and Lois, what is our total in the endowment right now? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, while, she's, <laughs> while, while she's looking, I'm going to read uh, Jen's comment in the chat, chat box asking if the uh, finance and endowment committees could propose a policy change to the board of direct, 
directors on this and, and the answer is, is, is a yes. They can submit a, a request for a policy change. Absolutely. I know they can, but will they? <laughs> I was more of a, would you mind <laughs> doing that research? It's all in the intonation. In addition, I, I'm just asking in addition to looking at ways that we can further invest within the policy that we also look at ways to adopt a change to that policy um, to be more in keeping with, I think our financial goals. Um, and and all, of course, keeping in mind our our values um, and, the, and the limitations on, um, um, you know, on, on, on having a small, you know, dedicated staff, right? So one of the things I know this came up in our discussion in MET and, um, you know, one of the concerns that Mary Beth raised, which I think is valid, um, is about oversight of, of investments, right? And without having, uh, we, we have a very limited staff um, and the rest is volunteers, as you all know. So the, the question that Mary Beth raised that I think needs to be addressed in addition to, um, I think the, the, the proper investment of money in, in alignment with our values, but it's also the proper oversight of our monies um, in, a, in, in this, you know, in, in our congregation, which is um, very important. You have to have somebody who's, who's very diligent with that, that we don't let things, you know, just go. <laughs> um, so, so that's, I think, part of what needs, it's, it's a challenge, I think, that, um, that I think we can overcome, but I think that's what needs to get, um, needs to happen here. Yay, Elaine, glad to hear it. Well, um, I'm trying to figure out which part of what's in uh, Vanguard right now is, um, is the endowment, and, but part of that is also money's. I, um, I'm going to complete Lewis's sentence. <laughs> I, I think uh, in the Vanguard, there's 100,000 capital money and 277 for the endowment, I think. Because um, this is before the accounts were, um, segregated. Uh, Mary Beth would know the exact amounts because she does the um, the 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 bucket watching. I mean, even though we have everything in Vanguard, those things are segregated by program accounts. So, uh, Mary Beth has uh, Mary Beth has the exact. The the bequest endowment is currently at two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. Thank you. I didn't know you were there, Mary Beth. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, some good comments and discussion in, in the chat box. Claudia, to your question about methodology of oversight within other UU churches, I, I uh, am sure this will be part of the evaluation going into the, the um, proposed policy changes. Uh, and so um, probably right now, no, but that's something that we will be looking into. Okay, well, thank you for being with us uh, for this time, um, for the informational meeting, for in pre preparation for next month. Uh, we, uh, we, thank, we, thank, we thank you for joining us. And uh, again, one more reminder that your presence will be needed uh, because we do need a quorum to proceed with voting. So in extinguishing our chalice represented here and honoring Music Sunday, I'd like to share the words of Alicia Carpenter from hymn number 300 called With Heart and Mind, which is in the Great Book as a wish for our church. With heart and mind and voice and hand, may we this time and place transcend to make our purpose understood, a mortal search 
for mortal good. A firm commitment to the goal of justice, freedom, and peace for all. A heart that's kind, a heart whose search makes love the spirit of our church, where we can grow and each one's gift is sanctified in spirits lift where every door is open wide for all who choose to step inside. Thank you so much for being here and being a part and sharing your questions and concerns. <laughs>